honor to have Matt Reynolds here today, who's our speaker. Um, so Matt is the um, Norton Network's assistant professor in ECE at Duke University. Um, Matt's actually ha had many hats in his past life. Uh, so prior to Duke, he graduated from MIT, then went to Georgia Tech as a research faculty member, and now he's at Duke. And in kind of sprinkled throughout his career, he's started many companies, helped co-found many companies based on some of the research he's been involved in. Um, Matt's work is really interesting in that he focuses both on the physics of the sensing problems he's looking at, but also looking at the embedded systems challenges and, and working on all the glue between the, the, the embedded challenges and the physics behind those problems and, and really creating systems that, that work and can be deployed in the wild. And so having said that, I'm going to just take it over, uh, uh, Matt, take it over from here. Thank you very much, uh, Shwedek, and thanks everyone for uh, having me here. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day in, in Seattle uh, after all, so I brought the good weather from uh, North Carolina. The um, title of this talk is uh, Wireless Beyond Wi-Fi. And I'd like to motivate that uh, by, by telling you a little bit about a research uh, question that's been with me in the back of my mind for a long time, which is, how can we build smart things? And what I mean by a smart thing is some kind of energy-aware system that combines sensing, computing, communication, and actuation in a closed loop. So I say that an energy-aware system or an energy-constrained system that combines sensing, computing, communication, and actuation, and that should sound a lot like the, the workings of a cell, right? This, to me, is the atomic unit of computing, and this is how all of the systems that I'm building are, are oriented. Um, Schwedek mentioned a little bit uh, about the, the sort of the impact of my research. I'm very interested in entrepreneurship and research uh, commercialization. And there are some examples here of um, companies that I've co-founded to commercialize research, um, in some cases from my uh, um, graduate work at MIT and then um, also with Schwedek. Um, so right out of graduate school, I, I co-founded ThingMagic, which is an RFID uh, systems company. And we were really the first company to apply software-defined radio techniques to RFID for uh, multi-band, multi-protocol RFID readers um, over 10 years ago now. Um, I've also transitioned technology from Georgia Tech in the energy disaggregation field with uh, Schwedek into uh, Zensi, which is now a division of, of Belkin. And uh, I was working on high-speed sampling of appliance events on the line and uh, developing load signatures and feature vectors that could be used for disaggregation of energy events in, in electricity. And then uh, more recently with, with uh, Schwedek, um, student Gabe Cohen and Jeremy Jake, uh, we've co-founded Snoopy, which is a wireless home sensing um, company coming out of some uh, Georgia Tech and UW um, IP. And the goal here is, is to do inexpensive sensing in the home with a battery lifetime of over 10 years. And, you know, I, I have kept my mind, you know, split between the commercialization side and also scientific applications. And I'm, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about scientific applications today. I, I've been increasingly interested in, in biological research and, and biomedical applications of this technology. So here's the big picture. This is a takeaway I'd like you to get uh, from this talk. Point one, there's plenty of room for innovation in wireless. Point two, wireless is not just for communication. Wireless can also be about providing power and doing sensing. Point three, wireless is not just double E stuff. You will see in a couple of these examples that there are fundamental computer science problems at the heart of these wireless um, challenges, and, and I think that fundamental uh, CS is going to have a big impact on the future of wireless. So here's an outline of the talk. Uh, the first project I'm going to talk about is a biological sensing project. It's actually a, a neuroscience or neurobiology project. Uh, we're designing uh, neural telemetry systems to fly on dragonflies to peer into the mind of the dragonfly. Very small mind, but they do some very big things. Um, second section of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, MIMO wireless power transmission. You're probably familiar with MIMO in the context of optimizing uh, channel capacity. I'm going to talk about MIMO from the perspective of optimizing energy transfer um, uh, to a wirelessly powered device. And then the third example, which is some work that we recently published in Science, um, it's a project in compressive imaging with millimeter waves. And that has applications uh, in homeland security and all kinds of other, other fields. So let's, let's start with the uh, Dragonfly project. This is uh, ultralight neural and EMG telemetry from dragonflies in flight. 
And I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge my collaborators, Anthony Leonardo from uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They have a neuroscience research facility called Genelia Farm. It's kind of the bell labs of, of neuroscience. And also Reed Harrison from University of Utah and Intan Technologies. Reed is an expert in, in biopotential amplifiers, and he designed uh, the front ends that uh, we use in this work. So let me start by orienting you a little bit to the, to the science of this problem. Uh, dragonflies are remarkable animals. They are carnivorous. They feed on the wing. What that means is that dragonflies take off from some kind of perch, they fly up in the air, and they catch a tiny flying insect and eat it. They also mate on the wing. They spend all, all their time eating and mating and then sitting on perches. And what's interesting about this is that dragonflies are remarkably efficient uh, hunting machines. In some trials, they have a success rate of 95% at capturing flying prey. So they have some internal mechanism that allows them to intercept prey in midair and grab it with their little forelegs and eat that prey. And here's three examples of, um, of uh, uh, video motion capture of dragonflies um, intercepting prey regardless of trajectory. So in this first trajectory, this is a relatively linear prey trajectory right here. Dragonfly curves up, grabs it. Here's a, definitely a, a, a messy uh, prey trajectory, the dragonfly takes all kinds of strange turns, intercepts the prey, grabs it. Here's a third trajectory. The prey is all over the place, yet the dragonfly is still able to track and capture it. And the, the critical science question that we're interested in is how does the nervous system of the dragonfly update its wing steering commands to maintain an interception course with the prey regardless of the path that the prey takes? Clearly, that's got a visual component. Dragonflies are looking at the prey um, in order to, to um, uh, servo their flight path to intercept the prey. What is, th there are some biological hypotheses about how that may happen. We are interested in validating those um, hypotheses from, from biology. And this is some work that actually made uh, New York Times a couple weeks ago. There, you may have seen an article on, on um, uh, dragonflies, and th that was really highlighting the work of uh, Rob Olberg, which are the first few um, references there. Rob has identified um, a set of neurons, 16 of them, called target selective descending neurons. Um, these are neurons that guide or appear to guide the, uh, the path of the dragonfly. And the hypothesis is um, that dragonflies are using a method that would be familiar to a navigator in a ship or an aircraft or a missile intercept that they're using uh, proportional navigation. The dragonflies are servoing their acceleration in order to maintain a constant angle between the prey and the horizon. And if the dragonflies did this, we would be able to um, observe uh, constant angles and we would be able to observe wing steering commands that, that met this hypothesis. So this is what we're trying to, trying to validate. You could look at this as a control system. This is the double E's view of a dragonfly in flight. The dragonfly's got some flight path that it's, it's observing um, with its eyes, um, and that is causing a control signal to be sent down these target selective descending neurons, which then cause the wing steering um, to change to intercept the prey. And then this would be some kind of feedback or control loop that's affecting the dragonfly's flight path. And you can see a couple of micrographs here showing these target selective descending neurons. They come down from the dragonfly's um, brain. They go down the nerve cord. Uh, dragonflies don't have a, a spine, but they do have a nerve cord. And they, they terminate at a ganglion where the wing uh, muscles are controlled. And here's a micrograph of a cross-section of, um, of the nerve cord of the dragonfly with these uh, target selective descending neurons identified. And, and you can see something about these neurons uh, compared to their neighbors. They're very large. Very large neurons conduct impulses fast, and that is exactly as would be expected from neurons that are uh, implicated in, in flight control. Um, so the hypothesis is that these are the, the neurons that are conducting wing steering impulses down to the, um, down to the wings, and <clears throat> we're gonna measure them, do model validation by free flight recordings of those neurons. Now, that's a very challenging engineering problem, to build something that can be attached to a dragonfly to telemeter out uh, uh, neural signals in flight. Um, so the species that we're working with, it's a, it's a species called uh, Libellula lydia, has a mass of about 400 milligrams. And dragonflies are remarkable aviators. They can carry about a third of their body weight in payload. 
but their payload is only about 130 milligrams in that case. So we need to build an extremely tiny, extremely lightweight telemetry system that can fit on the back of the Dragonfly. And what we've come up with is a complete flight package that weighs only 45 milligrams. That's less than the weight of a postage stamp. It's made out of a small flex circuit module with a single chip on it and a couple of supporting components. And it receives its operating power wirelessly, sort of like an RFID tag, but with a lot of neural inputs. Um, and it's, it's attached to an antenna that's made out of very fine silver wire um, reinforced with, with carbon fiber to keep it, it rigid. So we have developed a system that has, supports 10 neural and four EMG signal inputs with a complete weight, complete package mass of 45 milligrams, wirelessly powered. The weight of a battery would obviously be intolerable in this situation. And the Dragonfly is telemetering back data at five megabits per second. So we are not just sampling the spike trains on these TSDNs, we're sampling their waveforms at 26 kilohertz and sending them back uh, in, as 11-bit samples back from, the, um, back from the Dragonfly to the base station. How can we do that? Well, the answer is to borrow some technology from the world of RFID. Um, obviously, we are energy constrained and complexity constrained in this system. So we would like a communication modality that's very power efficient and very simple to implement. And the, the modality that we've chosen is modulated backscatter communication, which UHF RFID tags use. That's the subject of a whole other talk, if you'd like to, uh, to do that offline. Um, but the, the net net of it is that we can build systems that are extremely power efficient, even at very high data rates. So here's a plot of a bunch of different communication standards. You see our familiar um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth up here in the sort of 10 nanojoule per bit uh, regime. These systems, including the Dragonfly system and another system I've been working on, are in the 1 to 10 picojoule per bit range, so about 100 times more power efficient than Wi-Fi. This is in the highest energy efficiency regime of any reported communication system. So here's the system architecture we're working with. Um, we have uh, a base station, which is uh, placed in this perch. You can see the perch box here with a little uh, petri dish containing bananas for the fruit flies to eat. And uh, the, the dragonflies take off from the surface of that perch and in intersect, or sorry, intercept their prey um, up in that volume above the perch box. So we have a transmitting antenna and a receiving antenna inside the perch box, which is sending wireless power to the dragonfly and receiving backscattered communication coming back from the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly has a single chip device, which has an RF power harvester, logic, MUX, ADC, and then the all-important biopotential amplifiers to get the neural and EMG signals back. And you can see what that looks like um, attached to a Dragonfly in the lower uh, right-hand side of the slide there. We've got the dipole antenna coming, um, coming back from behind the, uh, the animal, and then the uh, telemetry backpack in this particular photo is mounted actually uh, on the abdomen. And then what's not shown are the electrode array, which is implanted into the nerve cord. This is what that chip looks like uh, that we've developed for this uh, task. And again, this was a collaboration between my group at Duke and Reed Harrison uh, from Utah. There's a block diagram of the chip on the left and then a micrograph of the chip on the right. And there's a couple things I would point out to you. One is uh, most of the dye area of the chip as you can see, is consumed by the amplifier array. So most of the chip's area is dedicated to the sensing task. By reducing the burden on the communication side, we've opened up dye area to be available to the um, biopotential amplifiers. Um, the RF part of the chip is very small. You can see it down here. This is the RF power harvester and, and data modulator. Um, so the RF power and data circuitry is very small consumes very little dye area, and also very simple. You don't see any on-chip inductors or other things that uh, you would find in a traditional radio architecture. This makes the chip work well, even though it's implemented in a pretty much a trailing edge process. It's implemented in a 0.35 micron um, process. So we have a chip <clears throat> that's got most of its dye area dedicated to the sensing function that we're actually interested in, and we've minimized the, the uh, dye area required for the communication and power tasks. This is what the power breakdown looks like. This is pretty remarkable compared to almost any other kind of, of sensing system. So if you look at the pie chart on the right, we've got 84% total 
of the power of this system going to the sensing task and only 2% going to communication. You contrast this with almost any other type of wireless sensor device and you, you will often see the opposite. You'll see most of the power going into communication and very little of the power going into sensing. So by adopting this wireless power and backscatter architecture, we can, we can turn that um, on its head. So the, the measured DC power consumption of this system is 1.2 milliwatts. It's all beamed in wirelessly from the antenna in the perch. Um, and um, the backscatter communication is consuming only 19 microwatts out of that total, or about 2%. And we've achieved a communication figure of merit from an energy perspective of four picojoules per bit. And you would compare that against uh, Wi-Fi, let's say, at 10 nanojoules per bit. Um, this is what the flight package looks like in its entirety. Uh, we don't have the mass budget for a traditional printed circuit board. So we have done uh, chip-on flex bonding to make a very tiny flex circuit package. It's actually dominated by the weight of the epoxy that encapsulates the chip. That black blob on the chip is most of the weight of the system. Um, there are a couple of bypass caps and a couple of matching. Uh, there's a matching inductor and matching capacitor on there, but they add negligible weight. Uh, and you can see on the lower right-hand side the MEMS electrode, uh, which is designed specifically to probe those target-selective descending neurons. Um, that's a cross-section of the nerve cord there for scale. Um, that's the subject of another talk entirely. That's, that's done um, through some MEMS uh, fabrication techniques. If you're interested in more detail about this flight package and so forth, we have a paper in uh, T-Biocast from uh, last fall. Um, in terms of what we've been able to achieve with this system, um, we have a wirelessly powered, extremely light, multi-channel uh, neural telemetry device with essentially equivalent uh, signal-to-noise ratio to commercial systems. So here is a, a plot of a pre-recorded MDT1 target selective descending neuron from a commercial rack. That's up there shown in blue. And then the red trace is over the air data from our system. So this is showing one uh, channel at a time, but we've also measured crosstalk and so forth. And this, this system is essentially equivalent to the commercial rack. Where we are with this project is beginning our actual science runs. So we've done a lot of engineering runs of this system, what we call bug on a stick testing, uh, to validate the communication link, to validate the power link, um, to validate that we're getting clean signals. We're going to move from bug on a stick to free flight. And I can show you a movie of, of one of the very first flights of this system. Uh, you'll, it's hard to see the, the antenna trailing the dragonfly, but you'll see it in a moment as it, as it turns around. It's actually feeding, so it's, it's demonstrating normal behavior for a hungry dragonfly. It's going to go grab some prey right now, and, and I think in this view you can see the antenna trailing behind it. So these are, these are um, freely flying, freely behaving animals which would be the standard for doing this, this kind of measurement. So we're hoping that, that uh, sometime in the end of the summer or early next year, we'll have the science data that lets us uh, validate that proportional navigation hypothesis and show conclusively that those uh, target selective descending neurons are in fact the flight control neurons and that the dragonflies are using proportional navigation to find their prey. Um, and, you know, we're using a combination, obviously, of a high-speed video to watch the prey. We can't build something small enough to fit on a fruit fly yet. Um, but uh, we can definitely get the data back from the dragonflies. Um, any questions about this system before I go on to the next? All right, I'll, I'll just go on to the next system and you can ask questions at the end. So the second part of this talk is about powering wirelessly powered devices. And I know that uh, there's a substantial body of work going on here at University of Washington, um, Josh Smith's group um, and others working on wireless power. Um, we are addressing one um, interesting problem in wireless power um, based around MIMO techniques. So here's, here's the idea. In a traditional RFID system or in most um, wireless power systems, you have a single transmitter that you install as part of some infrastructure that's sending power and possibly communicating with some kind of wirelessly powered device. And I put an RFID, picture of an RFID tag there, but it could be any kind of wirelessly powered device. In the long run, you may be wirelessly powering your Google Glass with uh, some, some type of system like this, but um, for the moment, we're looking at, at small devices or sensors like the Dragonfly device. So this is the, the traditional model that has been used in the RFID business 
for a long time. Next, imagine that you have an environment with multiple transmitting antennas. This is done to some extent in the RFID world today, but there's no coordination among those uh, multiple sources in the environment. In other words, the, the power that is received by the wirelessly powered device is essentially some random function of the power that is transmitted by the transmitting antennas and the multipath in the room. Um, so what we'd like to do is kind of change that game by saying, okay, we'll have multiple distributed transmitters. We'll do something to control the transmitted signals to optimize power transfer to our wirelessly powered device or maybe to multiple wirelessly powered devices in the environment. And what we'd like to do is selectively boost or deny power to a wirelessly powered device. Okay? We would be interested in boosting power if we need to send more power to a device to do something um, you know, more power intensive. Let's say like take a sensor reading or take a picture or do some actuation task. Right? We would be interested in selectively denying power to a device. Let's say if you have a person who has a pacemaker and you don't want to have their um, their power, uh, surface power density exceed a particular level. You'd like to deny power to that particular area. The challenge is how to do this without measuring the power at the device. So we have a way of doing this. By using the modulated backscatter communication technique that I mentioned before, we can observe the scattering coming back from the object while it is transmitting data and that scattering is either a linear or nonlinear function of the incident power. And we have shown that this works in both the linear and the nonlinear case. So we can control uh, the four transmitters or however many transmitters there are in an environment to selectively boost or deny power to a wirelessly powered device without measuring the power at the device. And we're going to do that by rethinking MIMO techniques to optimize power delivery, not channel capacity. So channel capacity mixes the notions of signal-to-noise ratio and bandwidth. We don't really care about those things in the wireless power mode. We care about power. Let me explain to you how, um, how we're working on this. Um, we've developed an indoor MIMO test bed um, at Duke. That's, that's myself and, and uh, postdoc Daniel Arnitz. It's an 8x8 eight eight, uh, MIMO setup. So we have eight transmitters and eight receivers. And you can see them um, in a combination of transmitters out there in the environment on little uh, stands, and then receivers on a mobile cart. Okay, so we've got an 8x8 system. We're operating over a 2.9 gigahertz bandwidth from 100 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, which is right in the, in the prime wavelengths for wireless power transfer. And we've done uh, surveys of the actual propagation environment in our building at 3,012 mobile device positions, and that's a data set of about 56 gigabytes. Okay. The downside is the data set is 56 gigabytes. The other downside is we had to do this at 3,012 mobile device locations. The upside is once we've done this once, we now have a corpus we can work with uh, where we can do a lot of uh, virtual experiments to uh, test our algorithms for the power transfer optimization. One of the things we can do, which it, I have not seen before, I'm sure it, it has been considered before, is take the, the frequency domain measurements that we get from our uh, MIMO measurement setup, do an inverse Fourier transform, and turn them into a time domain representation. And that will let us make a movie of the propagation of the signals as they leave the transmitters and reverberate around in the environment. And what's interesting about this, this is not a simulation. This is measured data. So we can launch a wave from a source, you see the leading edge of the free space spherical wave. You see the radiation off the back of the antenna hitting the, the, the back wall. It propagates forward in steps of a few hundred picoseconds. Here's a reflection off the elevator walls. You see the reverberation die down um, in the environment. And if we wait a few seconds, we'll see the reflections from uh, the doorways at the other end of the hallway. That comes in um, at about 150 or 200 nanoseconds. So we can slow down time and directly observe the propagation of waves in the environment and see where multipath is coming from and why there are hot and cold spots um, in the environment. So here's some second pass reflections. That led us down this path of, of developing the uh, wireless power concept. So the idea is we've got uh, 
in our experiments, a synthetic MIMO transmit and receive array of some number L transmitters and some number N receivers. And they're providing forward link power to a wirelessly powered device, which also happens to be uh, a backscatter transponder, at least for this purpose. So we see the scattering coming back from the device. The assumptions that we're working with are that the total power in the system is constrained. In other words, um, the FCC says we can use X watts of power and we can distribute it freely as we wish in the system. Um, and we're going to use only the backscatter signal to estimate the MIMO channel. We're not going to do any channel estimation on the, um, on the wireless device um, at all. So here's a, a system level view of this. We transmit a signal from a particular transmitter. It goes over a particular linear but messy multipath channel. It hits a backscatter transponder. The scattered signal comes back through the channel to a receiver. So we observe this received backscattered signal. And the thing we want to optimize is the forward power, PAV, which is a hidden variable um, in the problem. We can set this up. Uh, as an expression, a series of expressions for the, uh, the forward link and backscattered power. And we can set it up as an optimization problem. So this is an example of something that initially appears to be an uh, electromagnetics problem that at its core, at least in terms of solving the problem we want to solve, turns into an optimization problem. And this can be as complex an optimization problem as you want. If you want to solve this problem for one mobile device, that may be relatively straightforward. If you want to solve it for all points in the environment, you've got a 56 gigabyte data set uh, to work with. Um, so we were trying to optimize a hidden variable uh, given a particular observable, which is the, the backscattered power from the MIMO device. <clears throat> Let me give you some orientation to what this um, looks like. We've got our same environment where we're doing this synthetic experiment of the, of the wireless transfer system. We're going to have a mobile device take the orange path through the environment. So the mobile device is this red circle. It's taking the orange path through the environment. And there are these blue locations, which are transmitter locations for our system. Um, so we have the, the transmitters distributed in the environment, and then the mobile device moving around in the environment. And what we would like to show is that we can selectively uh, minimize meaning deny power, or maximize, meaning enhance power, delivered to that mobile device as it moves around in a complex multipath environment. So we've solved this problem twice with a lot of compute time. In the lower left-hand side there, you'll see the minimization. This is a little rain cloud that follows Charlie Brown around because he gets minimized power. And then the guy on the right-hand side has uh, paid his subscription fee and so he gets enhanced wireless power. So you'll get to see the, the little rain cloud following the minimized guy and the little red spot following the maximized guy. You'll also see in the upper right-hand side a plot of what happens when we maximize power delivered to the device, minimize power in uh, the random case, which is someone who's not participating in the optimization scheme. So here this goes. We move along the path. You see the little... Um, Rain cloud following Charlie Brown there on the left. And you see the red spot following the, the guy who's being maximized. And you notice that we're not steering a beam, right? This is not a, a steered beam system where a spot beam is illuminating a particular point in space. We're, we're maximizing power delivered to the environment, and we know that will have uh, <clears throat> local maxima and minima everywhere else in the space. So it's an interesting um, optimization problem. And what we see is, uh, is, again, at least in this 8x8 system, we see um, uh, best case gain of what we would expect, which is about 8 dB um, for the maximization case. Um, there are some uh, variants on that as we go through the environment. And we see uh, minimization that's very significant over 10 or 20 dB. So the guy who's getting maximized gets, let's say, an advantage of 8 dB over the random case. And the guy who's getting minimized is uh, getting minimized by over 10 dB um, in all cases. And we have more information about how exactly we solve this problem, particularly in the nonlinear device case, which is the interesting one mathematically, uh, in a paper uh, actually last week at, at IEEE RFID. So where are we going with this? Well, we've, we've demonstrated 
with measured data that we can selectively enhance or deny power to mobile devices with minimal complexity at the mobile device. We can do that without requiring a survey or calibration. Now, we did survey the environment to get the data set that we were working with, but we're using it in an online mode as a synthetic experiment, so we're not working on the whole data set necessarily at the same time. We've shown uh, that it works with nonlinear and most nonlinear devices. Sorry, it works with linear and most nonlinear devices. Turns out that most power harvesters are nonlinear devices, so that's the interesting case. And we also think there's a great opportunity to play with the cost function that we use. We can think of a cost function as enabling, let's say, a subscription model where we sell wireless power to people on a subscription basis. If you pay for your wireless power, we can direct more of that scarce resource to you. Um, if, you if you wanted, we could do an auction model. So playing with the cost function gives us a lot of opportunities for interesting economics of wireless power. So the challenges in terms of actually building this system and running it in, in real time are that it's a dynamic real-time optimization problem, potentially with a large data set. So there's a significant uh, computer science problem to work on there. Um, that also includes the ne necessity of coordinating the infrastructure. So clearly some kind of, of, um, of um, phase reference has to be provided in the infrastructure, but you probably also want to coordinate the update of each of those um, um, transmitter magnitudes and, and phases. And then, as always in the wireless power world, we have safety and regulatory constraints um, to worry about uh, bandwidth or, or power density that could be, uh, a person could be exposed to. Yes, question. So how many of these devices are you powering in the environment? Are you targeting everything for one device, or how does complexity change as you're trying to power multiple devices in the same environment? Sure, that's a very interesting question, and one that we don't totally know the answer to because it will be data dependent to some extent. If, for example, you have um, two mobile devices in this large open area, they're all experiencing, really, free space propagation from the nearest transmitter. If you have multiple devices along a corridor where there's no transmitter, you're relying on multipath to deliver power to that device, right? So the answer is different in the line of sight versus non-line of sight case. And we've done some you know, kind of initial exploration of that, but the story is far from, from over. Yes. <coughs> on the same topic, when you're plot, plotting the power, is it average power because, because multipath instantaneous power would also fluctuate, right? We assume that at each time step of this simulation, we update the, the transmitter magnitudes and phases to optimize at that particular time step. So that's the, you know, if you were stationary, that's the value you would get. If you're moving, obviously there's some average that occurs over that whole space, but it's always better than random. In other words, you never lose by doing this. You always win. You win by a varying degree. Uh, actually, my question was with respect to this, this graph on the top right. Yeah. So well, that, what we are seeing is just <clears throat> with respect to distance, right? Ah, this is distance along this curved path, yes. OK. Yeah. But that would also change with time, also, a bit, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand that. So at each moment in time, we, you know, we assume local Stationary yeah, condition. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. So I, I didn't understand how you could do this without a survey because the wave propagation will bounce off the walls and all that. It depends yeah. on the distance to the you know receiver. So so we that's where the MIMO comes in. So we observe the forward. We, we're sorry. We 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 extract the forward channel from the backscatter measurement. So we assume that if we have a transmitter location, we also have a receiver there. The receiver is observing basically a virtual source at the location of the backscatter device. And so that virtual source is letting us estimate the channel at that location. Um, so it's really the magic comes from having not just a transmitter distributed, not just transmitters distributed in the environment, but also distributing receivers. That's what's let, what's let, what lets us do this without pre-computing or pre-measuring um, the complete channel everywhere. This last project is on uh, compressive millimeter wave imaging. And this has a lot of applications in the security field, as anybody who's recently traveled through an airport can attest. Um, I'd like to, to thank and acknowledge my, um, my collaborators and, and um, um, 
you know, they, they're uh, top people in, in their fields. Uh, David Smith from the Center for Metamaterials and, and um, uh, something plasmonics um, at Duke University, and, and Dave Brady, who's a computational imaging person. Integrated plasmonics. So let's start by asking the question, um, how to build a camera. So I've got here on the left uh, a view of what a traditional camera might look like. You take uh, a scene, the letter A in this case, and you use a lens to focus that scene on some detector array of pixels. That would be a traditional camera, some kind of lens plus a focal plane array. If you want n pixels in your output image, you have n detectors because it's a focal plane array. Another approach, which has recently become very interesting because of the development of uh, compressed uh, imaging and sensing, is an approach that some folks from Rice and other places have been developing where you have a single pixel detector and you look through a mask at the scene. And so what you observe at the single pixel detector is a series of linear projections of the scene in some basis, re resulting in a measured value at that single pixel detector. And they've shown that you can reconstruct the scene uh, using this combination of, of projections. We're doing something similar, also compressive in nature, but in the electromagnetic domain, or rather in the domain of the wireless world. And so what we've developed is a very unusual antenna. Uh, most of the time, when people design an antenna, they design it to have a narrow beam that points in a particular direction. You would make an antenna that intentionally had directivity. Okay? We are interested in making an antenna that's not directive, that's not isotropic, but rather that has a lot of fine structure in the lobes of the antenna. So if you're a radar person, this is an antenna that maximizes the side lobes. And what you do by doing that is illuminate the scene with a, with a set of superpositions of spherical modes which illuminate the scene and which can be detected, the, the scattering from the scene can be detected back at the same port. So here's the conceptual sketch. We've got a, a port on an antenna, like a feed point. Uh, we launch a wave into some waveguide in the back of this metamaterial structure. The metamaterial structure is composed of many elements, which together form a, sort of an interference pattern, which creates a, a, a frequency-dependent uh, multiple lobe uh, structure that illuminates the scene. Now, in order to reconstruct a scene that is uh, really made out of a series of projections, one at each different frequency of these spherical modes, we have to think about imaging a little bit differently than we would think uh, for a, a um, focal plane array. We don't get a direct representation of the scene. What we get is um, something more indirect. And, and you know, we use a model that's very common in the computational imaging world where we, we treat uh, scene estimation as really a um, uh, problem where we have to um, estimate the scene from a noisy observation through a measurement matrix H. So our estimate of the scene is H inverse, the measurement matrix inverse, um, or sorry, the measurement matrix inverse uh, times what we observe. The idea is that we can encapsulate all of the imaging, imaging system in that measurement matrix H. In our case, we would be encapsulating all of the frequency-dependent behavior of that metamaterial surface in the measurement matrix H and all of its behaviors as a function of frequency. Now, why are we interested in doing this at millimeter waves? Well, for one thing, we can build these metamaterial structures in the microwave and millimeter wave regime, and it has not been a, it's not a fully solved problem to do that. Uh, at optical uh, wavelengths. But there's another reason why millimeter waves are of interest, uh, particularly to um, uh, certain research sponsors. Um, certain research sponsors are, are, imaging, are interested in imaging um, dielectric materials on the surface of human skin. And they would like to do that through clothing. This is the airport problem, obviously. And what you would observe here, or the reason why the, this millimeter wave regime is very interesting, is that we see at um, a frequency of 100 gigahertz, skin has a high reflectivity, not as good as metal, but a high reflectivity. But denim and t-shirts have a very low reflectivity and a very high transmission coefficient. 
So at these wavelengths, signals penetrate clothing and bounce off of skin and objects. So you can see through someone's clothes if you're looking for threat objects. And this is, what, this is an image that was done by uh, Synthetic Aperture of a, of a mannequin uh, wearing clothes. And you see various bright spots. Those are uh, regions of high scattering um, on, the, on the surface of the mannequin. Those would be where you'd go to look for, for threat objects. And you know, what's, interested, what's interesting for this perspective is that we can illuminate and, well, we can illuminate the scene and detect the scattering from the surface of the person or object we would like to image with the same antenna. So we use that same um, uh, metamaterial surface to both provide illumination and detection um, of the scene. So it's what we would call a monostatic system in the radar world. Um, this is what that metamaterial aperture looks like. I think actually David Smith was here uh, a few weeks ago to give a talk, um, and he, he would go into a lot more detail about it than I will, but the basic idea is that that, that metamaterial um, structure is composed of a lot of different resonators with different resonant frequencies. And in our case, we would like to make uh, as close to a random measurement matrix as possible. So we try to disperse uh, random uh, resonant frequencies around the surface of that um, metamaterial antenna. If you look at the radiation pattern from a single element, it looks pretty much like you would expect. But what happens when you have uh, multiple randomized um, uh, resonant elements fed along a transmission line or a waveguide structure is you get these very interesting lobe patterns that vary with frequency. So at least for simple cases, we can solve this directly with um, um, computational methods and compute what the spatial modes look like as a function of frequency. And you see that a small change in the frequency of excitation causes a big change in the, um, in the uh, computed spatial modes. That turns into a measurement matrix, which is a function of azimuth as well as frequency. So we take all of the dimensionality of the scene and encode it in the frequency domain. And then we have this not random, um, but uh, random-like, pseudo-random uh, structure in the measurement matrix H. Um, we could try to compute the measurement matrix H directly with computational methods. That would be a horrible um, uh, numerical problem. Uh, probably not something that could be solved for a big panel. So we work with calibration at this point. We do near-field calibration of these panels. Um, and David Smith is the guy to go to for all the details on that. Here's a, a, a view of where we are today. Uh, we've been working with reconstructions of single point targets. We assume that a real scene is going to be a collection of many point targets that together form um, an image. Uh, we expect that the sur surface of the human skin will be uh, relatively um, specular at these frequencies, so that's a good thing to assume. Um, <clears throat> and what we'll do is introduce a point scatterer into the scene. And once the point scatterer, it's a corner reflector in this case, gets into the field of view of the um, metamaterial aperture, you'll see the uh, solution uh, start to come into play um, on the right-hand side there. So we can track that target, um, in this case, in two dimensions, range and, and uh, angle, with only a single aperture encoding all of that information, range and angle, into the frequency domain. And what's interesting about this from a computational imaging perspective is that it's an inherently compressive measurement. We have a space bandwidth product of about 4,500 yet we're reconstructing that scene with only 100 measurements. Um, that's 100 different frequencies of observation to do that reconstruction. Um, so that's a compression ratio of about 40 to 1. And uh, we're using a particular um, um, iterative solution to that problem. Uh, details are available online. So where are we going with that? Well, we're working to develop a 2D metamaterial aperture, which we'll need, sorry? You were trying to track a moving object, right? Yeah. But would you really need like a wideband reader at millimeter? Could, could you just use like something like Doppler, for example, which is in your line of sight to, ah, so to yes. localize people? So, or objects in this case? Yeah, I agree with you that this is a very hard way of solving a very easy problem, right? But it, but it's, uh, it illustrates that the basic um, design or concept can work, right? We're looking at one point target right now. 
we're going to scale that to multiple point targets that together form a scene. If you think about a scene composed of many point targets that are moving together, Doppler is not, well, you have a choice of ISAR uh, techniques or Doppler techniques to try to solve that, but you're not going to get the full encoding of the image uh, into the frequency domain. We can talk more about that offline. Uh, so where are we going with this? We're developing a, a 2D metamaterial aperture and scaling our frequency from the 26 gigahertz that you saw earlier to the frequency range of interest, which is 96 gigahertz. Um, the technology that's out there in the airports today is all K-band stuff, and we're moving to W-band where we'll get resolution of about three millimeters. And we're continuing to work on the image reconstruction algorithms. That's something that's evolving in parallel with a very rapidly uh, evolving field of, of uh, compressive measurement. And the ultimate goal is to pilot this imager uh, with uh, DHS um, to, to be a possible replacement for the mechanically scanned imagers that uh, you see today. So back to the big picture. Why did I talk about these three systems in particular out of all the different things I've done um, in my career? They're unified by the fact that there really is plenty of room for innovation in wireless. Wireless is about a lot more than simply Wi-Fi communication simply bringing the internet to a mobile device. Wi-Fi uh, is just the beginning of the story. I, I expect we'll see a lot more sensing applications for wireless technology in mobile devices and in distributed sensors and so forth as time goes on. Another thing that, that has become increasingly clear to me from these projects in particular, wireless is not just double E stuff. It's not just electromagnetics. It's part of a, of a continuum of sensing that includes other fields, you know, it could be uh, neuroscience, but at their heart, all of these problems have a, a significant computer science problem at their heart. Many of them have inverse problems at their heart, optimization problems, thing that, things that computer scientists do um, every day. So you can't just look at the double E stuff in isolation. It's really part of, a, of an integrated um, package. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming to the talk, and I'd like to thank the many, many collaborators, postdocs, students, undergrads, and, and uh, funding agencies who made this work possible. Thank you. Yeah. So actually, just going back to the dragonfly experiment, mm -hmm. what happens when the fly actually moves and you'll have variations in the received and transferred form because now the channel is changing all the time and your antenna might not be in the field. You'll get disturbances on your power line and your signals won't be clean enough. Sure. So there's a long and a short answer to that. I'll give you the short one and then we can talk more about the long one offline. So the, the short answer is, at least for our initial experiments, we've constructed a constrained scenario. You may remember seeing that gray box where our electronics are and you notice that the feeding station is directly above the gray box. That's for a reason, so we don't have to solve that, that problem, at least initially. And it, and it lets us decouple you know, some of the challenges of the wireless channel from the problem that is needed, we need to solve from a biology perspective. Yeah, Josh. So could you <coughs> say a little more about the role of the metamaterials? Sure. So you know, I, uh, David Smith will, will tell you all kinds of wonderful things that metamaterials are capable of doing, right? I am interested in them um, from the perspective of enabling us to do new things with antennas that we couldn't do previously um, because they were either computationally intractable and we want to use this, um, you know, metamaterial approximation is, is really a um, um, uh, very powerful technique for doing that, an effective medium theory for the, the structure that doesn't require us to do the full solution um, in, you know, finite element or some other modeling technique. Um, you know, some of the other things we've been doing that I didn't talk about today are metamaterial lenses for focusing HF wireless power in the near field. So it's, it's a technology that's useful both in the near field and in the far field. Um, and expect some results this summer on the um, field-focused uh, HF stuff. Yes? So on your chip, it, uh, the, the, uh, the Dragonfly transceiver, yeah. it seems like you did a very impressive claim that this was um, some of the lowest energy uh, transmission that has been reported to date. Yep. Um, 
I mean, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you did that. I mean, what were the tricks in, in the chip itself, the transceiver, the architecture? Sure. And, and of course, there are many things that influence the power consumption of a transceiver. Uh, linearity, you know, phase noise, noise figure. I mean, do you, do you have anything you can comment on that? And, and of course, all those things will impact the power consumption also. Yep. So that's, that's part of a very, uh, very long discussion, but I, I'd like, I think I have a simple way of uh, framing that uh, discussion. Okay? I, I have a slide up here uh, showing the way most wireless links work. You have an access point there on the left, and there's a block diagram of the radio that might be inside an AP. Then you've got a mobile device on the right. And you see that they are exact mirror images of each other. Every element that's present in the AP is also present in the mobile device. And in many cases, the same chipset is used. Right? What we have done by using uh, scattering instead of, um, instead of active transmission is get rid of all of these red blocks. So we don't have any transistors with gain at the carrier frequency at all. All we have are transistors switching at the carrier frequency. So the, the analogy would be, let's say I'd like to communicate with you, uh, and you're a power-constrained device. I could illuminate you with a light source or an RF power source, and you could scatter energy back to me or not with the mirror. Well, in the radio domain, a mirror would be a switched impedance on the terminals of an antenna. So simply by switching the impedance that we present to the dragonfly antenna between a couple of well-chosen states, we can either scatter a little or a lot of energy back, or we can control the magnitude and the phase of the scattering. And what that lets us do is build this, this thing, I'll call it an impedance DAC, which lets us generate an arbitrary constellation by first designing the constellation that we want, mapping them to the scattering parameters, and then encapsulating those uh, scattering parameters in the impedance stack, connecting that to an antenna, and all of a sudden the energy that's scattered back implements a particular uh, uh, constellation. Um, so that's a, that's a lengthy... Um, so when you say that the, when you're recording, recording the power consumption, you're not including the power to illuminate this device, I take it. That's correct. So, so I'm, I'm recording the mobile device side, side of that equation. What's that? I'm reporting the mobile device side of that equation. And there is a penalty at the AP side or the base station side, right? We're, we're providing all of the power to operate the device with the forward link. What are those numbers? How much power are we providing? So in that particular example, we have one milliwatt uh, DC power required to operate the Dragonfly chip, or 1.2 milliwatts. And we're providing a transmitter power of about one watt um, into the antenna in the base station. The base station antenna has a gain of six dBi, so it's four watts EIRP. So we transmit four watts, we deliver one milliwatt to the Dragonfly. What we get back in scattering is in the microwatt regime, but that's still a very strong signal from a receiving perspective. So what's the, the maximum distance this fly can, can roam? Right, so we're limited by the forward link. If we operate with the one watt transmitter power, then we're limited to about a one meter volume over the perch, but that's sufficient for the scientific experiment the way it is constructed. If we turn up the transmitter power, we can go farther. Um, you know, limited at, this, at that point really by uh, human safety or safety of the animals. That, my, my point there would be that it's invariant in any wireless power transfer scenario. You, you're ultimately limited by the safe power density that you are willing to expose people or things to. Right. So one last question up there. Go Can we remove the forward link limit? So say your device is battery assisted. Yeah. How far can you pull out the basket? Yeah, so in th I, have, I don't have that result for the Dragonfly tag, but I do have it in this system, which is operating much faster. So this is a 96 megabit per second backscatter system with 16 qualm. And we did the, um, the uh, um, return link limited range, which would be the battery assisted scenario. And it comes out to be about 20 meters, assuming line of sight uh, propagation. So that's just uncovered. That's uncovered. Mm -hmm. All right, let's thank Matt again. Thank you.